Good morning, everyone. Continuing with the Bombay Orthopedic Society's e-learning initiative with the theme of winning decisions and getting it right the first time, we present you the next talk in the series by one of the most well-known orthopedic surgeons of India, Dr. Didi Tanna. Apart from being an innovator, he has been instrumental in developing trauma surgery in our country. He has many firsts to his name and in spite of being one of the most senior orthopedic surgeons of India, who has been the teacher of teachers, he continues to spread his vast experience and wisdom by lecturing all over the country. He has a busy orthopedic practice in South Mumbai at the Saifi and Bhatia Hospital, in addition to being a mentor and consultant at the Sir HN Reliance Foundation Hospital and Jaslok Hospital. Dr. Tanna is going to speak on winning decisions in non-union of fractures. In this talk, he is going to share his experience and vast knowledge about this difficult problem and more importantly, tell us on how to get it right the first time. I welcome him and thank him on behalf of BOS for accepting our invitation. Over to you, sir. Thank you for a very flattering introduction. I'm going to talk on winning decisions in non-union of the fractures of different, different fractures. I would suggest you go through this in small patches and ruminate over it rather than to complete the whole thing because it may take a long time and you may not be able to get the maximum out of this. I start with this. The conventional definition of a non-union, up till now what we have been teaching and I've been talking about is when the fracture does not unite in a reasonable time with sclerosis of the bone ends and now it is not going to unite without surgery. We all know this very well. But today, this definition is not functional because the non-union is defined as a failure of a fracture to unite when in a reasonable time, when the fracture is slowly not uniting over the different x-rays if you've taken it every month or so. So once it two or three months, if it does not unite, then probably we consider this as of time to interfere. Every fracture wants to unite, maybe in malunion. Most common cause of a non-union is surgical intervention to restore anatomy in the learning curve of the surgical art. And that learning curve lasts for life for most of us. Here it is. I learned over the time that here, the fracture, which is there, it would have united if it was there in a dynamic mode to start with. I had done the interlocking, which we were all told to do it in a static mode, and this fracture did not unite. All I had to do was this transverse fracture, static nailing, we forced the fracture into not uniting. It was converted to a dynamic mode, and the fracture unites. So this is how we learned over the time that this is what we should be doing it from day one. Now here is the same fracture, similar fracture, Non-union occurred in about four to five months time and it was dynamized by taking out the screw there and keeping only in the dynamic hole and then the fracture unites. But when it unites, what happens is you can see the events it is dynamized proximally, this screw will from the away from the fracture will come down and this nail has to go up a little in order to get the dynamization. This is how the principle of dynamization. Now, if I go through tackling non-union long bones option is dynamization, exchange nailing, bone grafting in a stable construct, and make the construct of immobilization rigid, and then bone grafting. Now, it is not always necessary to dynamize. This fracture heals up even without dynamization. And very often it happens. So dynamization, here it is how it is done. So this is the fracture. This is the fracture which is separated. And there is the screws in a static mode on both the sides. Now, when we dynamize it by taking out the screw from the lower end, the way the fracture collapses from here to here is that this nail has to travel down. So unless there is a place for the nail to travel down, dynamization cannot be executed. The same thing happens when you dynamize on the pro anterior or proximal end, the nail has to go up in order to dynamize. As it is seen over here, when it was dynamized, 
nail was ending here and after dynamization the nail went very high up this was in a badly comminuted fracture and in that situation is going to give rise to the shortening so we learn later that the transverse fracture at the isthmus of the femur and the tibia the treatment is reamed that is 1 to 1.5 mm larger than the nail which we are going to use ream 140 mm and nail 415 mm so when you ream 440 and nail 415 there is a space lower down which is already existing in which the nail can migrate down and nail it in a dynamic mode so the space for the nail to migrate down is there. And then once you do that, this is what's going to heal up immediately without any problem. Now here it is, you reamed 140 as it is here, and you nail, when you dynamize, there is a space for the nail to go down, so the nail can go down. And the nail has to be slightly short, so that there is a place to go down. And this is the one which is always going to work when you are doing the nailing for the shaft fracture in the middle at the isthmus level, where you don't even need to dynamize later, it is dynamized on day one. So adequate size nail, not a canal stuffing, pushed by hand and not hammered except at the end, in a dynamic mode, screw at the end of an oval hole away from the fracture. Quite a lot of people have a confusion that which is the dynamic hole. The away from the fracture in the oval hole is the dynamic hole. If you remember that, then you will have no other problem. As you can see here, in the fracture at the distal end, the screw has to be in the oval hole away from the fracture that is at the distal end. And same thing if you are going to do the dynamization at the proximal end, away from the fracture, so it has to be into the proximal end of this oval hole. That is once we remember, that should be fine. And a full weight bearing on day one, forget about the fracture, it will heal up. For dynamization to work, there has to be a place for the nail to travel distally or proximally when dynamized. So as you can see, but dynamize before the bone plug forms at the end of a nail. Here you can see, if you dynamize, you dynamize it here, but there, there is a bone plug which is formed. So the bone, the nail will not be able to go down and it will not effectively do dynamization and hence the exercise of removing the screws also will not help the fracture healing. The dynamization may not occur because to start with if you've done the nailing where it ends up into the subchondral area there is no place for the nail to dynamize or over the time there is a hole which was not filled up with the screw it will have a formation of the bone and then it will also not allow dynamization as you can see here this has been filled up with the bone or at the proximal end as all of us know there is always a new bone formation occurs so you dynamize after this new bone formation is occurred the dynamization will not be effective so you must dynamize it before this new bone formation occurs and here it is from the fracture site a piece of bone has traveled down and this is once you see it here is going to form a reaction and so this is going to block the dynamization process completely so the future wants to heal the fracture wants to heal and if transverse fracture or a short oblique fracture is kept distracted forcibly locking screws break and the transverse fracture tries to compact to heal this is an auto dynamization as we have observed this again and again as you can see in this case on day one, it was a fracture which was put in a slight distraction and at five months time, the, still the fracture is not healing and once at six months time, the screw broke and this gets auto-dynamized and then ultimately the fracture heals up. So this is what is the nature tries to do it by breaking the screw if it is possible and then the fracture heals up. So comminuted fracture, do not dynamize. It will shorten the limb, but if not healing, graft it. Here is the comminuted fracture, and this is what it was dynamized. And you can see how much of the nail has gone out. And when this nail goes out so much, it's going to end up into a lot of shortening of the limb, 
which will be requiring a lizara or a high shoes which is not desirable so in a comminuted fracture my suggestion is in such a comminuted fracture nail it in a exact length which is there so the way i would suggest is take the length of the opposite leg measure it properly and then you nail it in distraction so that the same length is preserved and as you can see it is in distraction and after a short time go down and do the grafting and once you've done the grafting this will heal up without shortening this is the ideal way and as you can see here if you cannot dynamize this it will collapse and the shortening will occur and there's the reason why you got to dynamize it if you want to otherwise you graft it early grafting at 3 to 4 months would avoid a nail breakage and the healing of the fracture will occur very well as you can see it over here this is the one which if it is done if it is grafted primarily it will heal up completely well this is two comminuted a fracture to go down on day 1 and to turn the fragment and even to graft this is a fragment which was there badly comminuted so day 1 the close nailing keeping the alignment and the limb length equal in a static mode was done and once it was done as you can see this is the piece which is turned on which i didn't want to do it on day 1 so i did it later on it was unturned the fracture and did the bone grafting and once it did the bone grafting after 4 weeks and then once it has been unturned 4 weeks bone grafting the vivek after grafting relocating the piece the fracture started healing this is 18 months and this is 24 months it has completely healed up in a normal length without any deformity without any shortening this is what i would suggest in a comminuted fracture here this is the case thanks to dr chandok from nagpur this was a com compound fracture this bone piece had almost come out and it had no soft tissue at all so this is comminuted fracture at the shaft femur with a devitalized fragment of the femur and ipsilateral neck of the femur so this piece which was there it had to be removed so this was removed proximal fragment it was out of the skin comminuted middle fragment devoid of any muscle attachment was out of the skin came out when the dressing was removed and the treatment option it was nailed in distraction post of check x ray after interlock nailing maintaining the length and once the fracture stabilizes and the wound stabilizes he went down and put in the fibula graft with the cancellous bone graft and this is what he did it and ultimately the fracture held up in this is 3 months time and this is a full function no shortening this is the way in which i feel the comminuted fracture we should go by do not shorten it immediately and try to rely on to the alizara but this is the way we can go by exchange nailing now if this nail which is there which is dynamized as you can see and not healed up because of this bone piece all what it needs is you same thing it has already been reamed it is already here there is the piece you put in a short nail exchange nailing is a short thick nail in a dynamic nail it will work here this is it was stable it was changed to a dynamic nail no screws were put inside and the fracture heals up or the fracture like this exchange nailing by putting in a short thick nail without any screws distally because it's not going to have any any role because the stability the partial stability is already established the few fractures here i am going to present which went on from surgery to surgeries for years due to wrong understanding before the union occurred these are the fractures which have been operated upon two three four times and when i came in to later on this is a fracture 20 years after the injury five operations no surgery for last 15 years no infection i don't know why the patient decided to come she was walking on to this but with the some sort of a support so i came into the picture at that time this is the fracture which is there so i went down did the osteotomy of the fibula did the correction of the nailing and put in three screws distally dynamized i mean proximally it was in a dynamic mode because the fracture was distally and a massive graft was put around the fracture after shingling and the shingling is very important shingling is basically i'll be showing a video later on 
repair the shaft away from the fracture the, and uh, under the fracture, uh, the proximally and distally and fraction the area and put in the graft underneath this osteoperiosteal flap which we have created. And this is the one which in five years time, it completely healed up. As you can see, the correction of the deformity, shingling, nail with three distal screws in a different directions and dynamic locking of the proximal end. And the fracture heals up, which you can see. Perfectly oh, good okay. range of movement without, and she can absolutely oh. flex the knee completely and walk about. This was the fracture, as you can see, again, non-union for four years after four surgeries. And you can see the fracture here. Again, if you go down at that four years, I went down, I corrected the deformity, fibular osteotomy, corrected the axis with the polar screw. I put the nailing. These are the polar screws, as you can see them, the nailing fibular osteotomy and this is perfectly held up, allowing the patient to walk about on almost a day one, corrective osteotomy, nail, polar screw and massive grafting. This heals up very well. Now here, a treatment for an established non-union of the shaft of the bone. This is the 34-year-old lady, shaft fracture. You can see this fracture is the junction of the upper two-third and lower one-third. This is where the femur is slowly expanding the medullary cavity. This is what was the first operation which was done. It did not unite and is in four months time, it did not unite and this is what is the position. If in case lower down, being at the end of the isthmus when the femur medullary cavity is expanding, nail which is subchondral with three multi-directional screws could have helped stability. It helps but not assures stability. Now nails like these are available where three, four screws, you can put it distally. It gives you a good stability for the lower one third fractures. Same fracture, the second surgery was done of exchange nailing and the lateral grafting. As you can see, the lateral grafting and a distal dynamic nail. Lateral grafting is not appropriate. The healing occurs mainly on the medial side and on, not on the lateral side. So I feel the lateral graft which we put in is always going to get um, absorbed most of the time. And here it is that though it was done in a dynamic mode, that is still there is a bone plug which is there. So the nail is lower and the bone plug at the end. So no place to migrate down for effecting dynamization. So even after 11 months and second surgery, the fracture did not unite. And this is second surgery one year, three months after the first surgery and still the fracture doesn't unite. This is ultimately 20 months after the second surgery. When the fracture didn't unite, this is the stage I took over. And then it was very easy for me. Same nail, I didn't do anything else. Now it has not united, it has been done. So I went down and did the medial grafting. I'll explain to you the, how this medial grafting is done and put in a supplementary plate. In order to put the supplementary plate, the first is the same nail, supplementary plate. In a, when you, before you put the plate, remove the distal screw of the nail and do the compression of the fracture with the DCP holes in the plate. And as I see it under a CM, I make a separate incision anterior medial right onto the bone so that when you go down through the vastus intermediates, take away the vastus media, my vastus medial is on one side and rectus femoris on the other side, and you are bang onto the vastus intermediates. You go down and do the osteoperiosteal shingling proximally and distally. So when you go down like this, you will be able to go posteriorly, medially, and anterior medially. So that is the way in which you do it and then put in a good amount of bone graft medially. This is the one, this is without disturbing the medial soft tissues, do a medial grafting after shingling. And as you can see, this is the medial grafting, and this is a separate incision for the medial grafting, as you can see it very well here. And then, fracture heals up. This is after removing the implant, about three years after the fracture, the first time the patient walked without pain, 
everything doing extremely well. So if you are careful about all the principles, how the fracture can unite in a non-union. In a non-union setup, you need a rigid mobility. And this combination of a supplementary implant or a plate onto the nail is one of the very easy and very, very effective way of healing this fracture. This was the fracture again, one month, even three screws were done. Even three screws distally and did not help healing. As you can see, the fracture has again gone in for a non-union. You can see we did the CT scan to find it out. And you can see here so beautifully it is seen. The cavity is small here and slowly it is expanding where the nail is not snugly fitting onto the lower part. And hence it is, there is going to be a small movement and that is the reason why the fracture does not unite. And as you can see it here, it is a proximal dynamization is done. The newborn formation occurs here, so it doesn't even dynamize. And then this is the one which ultimately it, it was not healing up and this is still gone into non-union. So as you can see here, primarily I would suggest a fracture like this to a primary plating and a grafting if needed because there is a gap and this heals up completely well or here was the case a fracture which was at the junction day nay, day one i did the nailing and the plating since there was no communication there was no grafting was done and then the fracture heals up extremely well with because of the nail the patient can walk about move about with the partial weight bearing on day one so my suggestion is on the fracture which is junctional of the femur at the upper two third and the lower one third with the expanding medullary cavity. Try to use in three screws distally and hopefully the fracture will heal up with dynamization proximal. Or if you have any doubt as in a fracture like this, go ahead and do a primary subcutaneous plating. Even these are the half screws which are there. This is the one which is a good chance of a primary healing because then the fracture heals up very well. Now, here was the fracture, which was communicated like this. The surgeon went in on the first day and did the nailing. And you can see this piece is way away from the fracture, and this is the nail, which is not supported. It's a very unstable situation. He did this nailing, which was done otherwise well, keeping the length, but didn't do and do the grafting early. And so this nail ultimately broke down and the surgeon went down and did this plating. And then now he has already fixed up with the circlage wire, reduced it very well. And then this is what it is four months after injury, one month after the second surgery. And this is going on. And this is five months after the second surgery. This is the stage when I saw the patient. There was no callus formation. There was no healing attempt which was there. So this was the first surgery, this was second surgery. Five months after the second surgery, I advised for the repeat surgery. So by the time they decide for the repeat surgery, this is one year, five months for the second surgery. This is how it is when, because obviously the operating surgeon feels this will always heal up, while the other surgeon feels this is not worth taking chance because a long time. Now one year, five months, this is very likely that the plate will break. And this is how the CT scan was done in order to convince the patient. The CT scan to me is not very convincing whether the fracture is a non-union or no. But the patient gets very easily convinced that this is a non-union. So at that time, patient got billing for the surgery. But by the time, one year, nine months, the patient decided the plate had already broken. So I saw him at this stage. But by the time he comes over in four days' time, the fracture is already, you can see, 2.8 and this is 15.9. In a in few weeks time, few days time, it already opened out and completely fracture was out. So this is the one I inherited at this stage. Now one year, 10 months, second surgery. Two years, five months after the injury. Patient was still walking about, going from place to place. And this is what I did. I went down did the PFN type of a nail and a supplementary plate and a medial graft the way I showed you. I did this surgery reduction fracture, loose dead bone, removed intramedullary nail, medial massive grafting and lateral long blade. And you can see in seven months time and one and a half year time, 
the fracture is completely healed up. Patient, because of the nailing on day one after the surgery, he was walking about with partial weight bearing. There was no question of a non weight bearing. And this patient walked for the first time four years after the injury. Now, I come to 19 years it took to heal this fracture. This was the nurse which was in a medical college treated by the professor. And this is what was the first surgery which was done. And then fracture did not heal up. So the surgeon was really confused and he did the dynamization. And then too much of a dynamization occurred and the fracture collapsed and it, the nail went up. These are the x-rays which were available to me, which I am showing you. And this went up, the nail was so much went up and because the screw broke here. And so the nail went up and there was a big collapse which had occurred at the fracture. Surgeon removed the, the top part of the nail. He couldn't remove the other part of the nail. So the screw and the remaining part of the nail remained there. 205, the broken part of the nail. 209. Again, this was a non-union, this was operated upon, and this is how it was changed over to a plating. This is the plating which was done, the blade plate which was done with the medial graft. And this is the screws which have been left behind because of the compression of the fracture was also done. But this also pain in the right hip while walking, mobility at the fracture site, broken plate with a non-union, five centimeter shortening. This is how it was. This is how it was, and uh, fracture did not unite. Once the fracture did not unite, this is how you had to go through. And fourth major surgery, 2013, November, short PFN with bone grafting. This is what was done, and this also ultimately did not work. The fracture went into for a non-union, and I took over 18 years after the fracture. The present issue is, has the fracture healed up completely? It doesn't look like it has healed up. Can the patient undergo implant removal? That is what the patient was asking because she was getting pain. She thought by implant removal, she'll be able to get rid of the pain. But as you can see, there is MDCT versus the digital radiography in evaluation of the bone healing in orthopedic patients. The American Journal of Radiology. Multi-detector CT scan reduces the stair step artifacts with multi-planar reconstruction when compared to the single detector CT. This multi-detector CT using high quality 3D reforming is recommended as the primary imaging technique for evolution of the bone healing. The ordinary CT scan, as I mentioned, is not always enough. So all conventional CT scan centers are presently equipped with MDCT facility. It is not a special machine. Only a particular dedicated sequence is required for doing the multi-detector CT scan. MDCT scan permits multiple slices or sections simultaneously along the fracture line and greatly increases the speed of CT image acquisition. It is a recent modality to confirm bone healing. That was done here, and then still the fracture is not united, so the decision was taken to reoperate. So I took it over in September 2018. I took it over after so many years. Segmental non-union, six inches of shortening, four major surgeries in past, the breakage of the implant, as you can see here, so I went down and in the same track which was there, I put in the bone graft, allograft, because he was already grafted everywhere. So I put in the same track and I put in the allograft there in order to fill it up and then did the PFN with the screw in the same track. And once you can see here, this is where it is. Slowly the graft is being pushed and more and more graft was put in. Ultimately, there was a plate which was put in and the massive grafting was done. The, this is the proximal femur plate which was put in. In this situation, I had to put in anteriorly because it fit in so much on the lateral side. So it was put in anteriorly. 
the synthesis nail 280 into 10 millimeter medial graft, yellow graft, graft in the head and neck purchase. No donor graft available, all iliac crests were used. Proximal femoral plate is during pre rotation plate. It became almost anterior lateral where it fitted in well, shortening one inch to compress the non union. And fortunately, this is three months. Fracture is healing up. Waiting is the present. Walking with the stick started. Teriparatide as a DEXA was minus 3.8. And day one, the last operation. Day six months, the last operation, as you can see. And this is nine months after the last operation. Fracture seems to have united. I hope it has united. So this is the time the patient with this compensation shoe of about an inch and a half, walking pain-free for up to 19 years. So if you operate the patient perfectly well with all the principles of stability, grafting, and, and the a double implant to give the rigidity, the patient has an excellent chance of healing. If fixation is unstable, make it stable by adding a second plate or an intramedullary fibula if the bone is not enough. Now the second plate and everything will be functioning when the bone is sufficient there. But if the, because of the non-union, there is a good amount of bone absorption has occurred and the bone is really thinned out, then it is not enough all the time to do a plating. Then the second implant can consider even on day one, as I mentioned about. Now this was the 45 year old male, five surgeries of the fracture, four surgeries, no infection. And this bone was, as you can see, not very good here, as it has been seen here. This is how we, the foreigner who came over here. So I went down and did an intramedullary fibula, as you can see it very well. And I did the phyllos type of a long plate. And once having done the phyllos type of a plate, so intramedullary fibula, long plate, and cancellous medial graft, everything at one sitting. Don't do patchwork. And this is how it is in 15 months' time. It is completely held up, as you can see here. So this was a this was the day one. This is 15 months. And then you can see this is a range of movement because after this you don't get a range of movement. But still here is a reasonable range of movement which is there and you can move about and walk about. So I feel no, an no. intramedullary fibula in such a fracture is a very great... This was again a loss of complete bone hair. 78 year old, 8 years after the last surgery. Five times we was operated before this. Infection, bone removal, and now no sinus for seven years. Going on for eight years, she wasn't willing for surgery. She came for a fractionic of the femur. I operated and could make her walk about immediately after the fracture. She was convinced and she got operated upon. This is how it is. I did the excise the ends which were pencil thin. Take a fibula without periosteum. It is easier to retrieval without periosteum than with the periosteum. Dilate the humerus medullary cavity mainly to measure the cavity with increasing remus. And then take the fibula, confirm it is, move, it is movable in the humerus medullary cavity on both sides of the fracture easily. Keep a large autograph ready from the iliac crest. And here it is, you can see, this is what I am trying it out. This is the fibula which is done, and this is the fracture is distracted. So then you compress the fracture. As you can see, I'll be compressing the fracture here. That is compress the fracture. It must be in a discompressed position. Then put in a plate and then put in the graft. And this is how it was treated, and it was so much of the bone loss was there. So ultimately, giving finishing touches, reconfirm the graft is moving in the canal, push it up all the way proximally, and then take it down. That is the only way you can put it in the medullary cavity. Reduce the fracture, distract, hold fibula end, and slowly push it distally. Now compress the fracture maximally. 
load the cancel and put in the cancellous bone all around. Put massive graft around the bone under the soft tissues. Cast me for my peace of mind. And here is the fracture. After all these years, it completely healed up with this intramedullary fibula, massive grafting, and the plating. This was very satisfactory. And as you can see, he had put in intramedullary fibula and shortened the humerus, getting compaction. And this is the one which ultimately heals up. Here was the fracture, which was treated by nailing and the grafting. This did not unite. This was done outside. So then he came over for me to be treated. And I treated with the nailing and the grafting medially. And I was absolutely sure it will heal up. But for, unfortunately, this also didn't heal up. And this was the bone which was almost got absorbed because of the nail which wasn't giving a good fixation probably. Did not putting in the dynamic mode. Remove the dead bone and put in the graft here. This ultimately went into non-union as you can see here. Two years, it went into non-union. So now this is the time I... This nailing was done by me. Probably I had not learned at that time that it should be put into dynamization on day one. So I ultimately went down, putting intramedullary fibula, massive bone graft, and immobilize it with the femur plate. Long femur plate was immobilized. And ultimately, in two years' time, you can see the fracture is completely united. So rigidity or the fixation of the fracture properly is very good. Here, there are two implants which are being used. One is the intramedullary fibula, and other is the plate. Now, this plate is put in, so this fibula intramedullary works in two ways. It works as a second implant, and the screw fixation into this porotic bone improves because some of these screws go through the fibula. So that's the reason why this intramedullary fibula works very well to me. If I was vaguely make a statement, I haven't failed a non-union surgery any time after putting in an intramedullary fibula and a massive graft and a rigid fixation. Now I consider distal fractures near the joints. These are the ones which I talked about, the shaft, femur, elbow, wrist, etc. This was a 91-year-old fracture patient which was there, treated on day one. I'm sure this was in a good position, so it was plastered. And then ultimately, 91-year-old, pain and discomfort, six weeks on plaster removal. This is how it is. And he was so much uncomfortable and a dynamic man, he wanted to become all right. So he signed it that I will not hold the doctor responsible if my fracture does not unite. But I please request him to get everything done for this fracture to unite. This because this, this is how his hand was. And it was totally non-functional. And that's the reason why he agreed for surgery at 91. And stupidly, I proceeded. This was the four months after the fracture I took over in this position. This was not united and it was in a bed. The whole wrist was hanging around. And what is the plan? And a 91-year-old, what was the expectation? So anyway, I took the iliac crest block graft. 91-year-old had a decent graft. That's the reason probably I could take a nice good graft. Iliac crest autograph harvested, stored in a mop. And mop tried to use, and the graft falls down on the ground. Now what? Pick it up. Clean four times with the saline, make it 10% povidine, iodine, and use it. No adverse effects are reported. These are the, some of the literature on that comparison of the five treatment protocols for contaminated bone grafts in reference to sterility and cell viability. These are the articles which have appeared for that. A set of discarded bone samples was taken from a series of 20 total knee arthroplasty operations. The bone samples were uniformly contaminated with the use of bacterial broth prepared from the cultural samples taken from the operating room floors. A dropped osteoarticular bone graft safely reimplantation in vivo. In vivo, and it, this is how was the thing: five minutes cleaning with 
10% povidin ion solution followed by a normal saline solution zinc appears to provide an optimal balance between effective de decontamination and cellular toxicity for a drop autologous bone in an operative setting. So in short, take the bone graft, take a povidin iodine and really rinse it out three, four, five times with saline, iodine, saline, iodine into these things and the same graft can be used. This is how it was done with the recent literature available. There is a fairly good evidence to say that the best way to reuse the fallen autograft is mechanically agitating it for 15 seconds each for five serial washes of the sterile basin containing 10% povidin, uh, povidin iodine and waiting for 15 minutes to let it dry and then washing it with the bone in a saline solution before implanting it. And here I proceeded after doing this procedure, I put the graft, they put the graft in between. So it was working as a strut graft between the distal part and the proximal part of the bone, which was all crushed. And it was put in with the another, another bone graft around and it was fixed it up. This is how the strut graft which was used and I excised the lower end of the ulna for uh, the supination pronation. This is the surgery and you can see in four months time the fracture united. The patient was extremely happy, the fracture united and he could move about and walk about the wrist as you can see very well. This was pre-operatively, he couldn't do the wrist and he could do the wrist. And then this, but you can see what has happened. He can move nice, the wrist nice. now, there is no problem. But, but he can't extend the fingers. This is what was new, which was out there. And again, he insisted, whatever best you can do, you try to do it for this finger extension. So we proceeded. And we proceeded to do it. And this were the tendons which were ruptured. So these tendons which were ruptured, extensions of the fingers were ruptured. So ultimately, at that age, we took them together and put in a tendon graft around it. And as you can see, this was the tendons which were ruptured. We can stitch it back and put in the around these ruptured tendons, which you can see them very well. All these tendons which were ruptured, they were threaded in. And then the graft was put in, as you can see, this is a big graft, uh, tendon graft was put in, connecting all these tendons together as a mass movement. So this is all what we felt can be done at 91 year old. This was stitched back. The continuity was established so proximal to distal with this tendon graft. Surgery was finished. And this is how it is. The fracture is very well united, as you can see here. And you can see the five months after the fracture. And you can see now, First class. he can move the fingers beautifully. So ultimately, the fracture is united well, and he can move his fingers very well. This is how ultimately we could really help him out. He was grateful. And obviously, after about three years or so, he expired. This is, if you can see, before the tendon surgery, and this is after the this this is the before tendon surgery, and this is after the tendon surgery. As you can see, this is before tendon surgery, and you will see this now the picture which is after the tendon surgery. So you can see that fracture is united, the tendons have improved, and functionally has been improved dramatically. The distal femur. Now, this was the fracture, which was distal femur. The original surgeon, 20 years, 8 years old, grossly compound fracture, treated in 2015 on day one. This was the fracture. And the surgeon just chose to put in intramed this uh, compression screws after, uh, after reducing and this neutralizing with these two K wires somewhere. Treatment on outside, debriment and this fixation. Those KYS really walked out and this infection occurred. KYS walked out and the screws were there. Fracture was in non-union with angulation, as you can see very well. Fracture of the femur and fracture of the tibia. KYS walked out. Now the infected, discharging sinus, plenty of antibiotics. Four months later, I took over. And when I took over, I took the CT scan to see the artery 
particular surface incongruity if it is there and this is how it was seen the articular surface was appeared to be not very well aligned fracture was in a bad position so we went down again and decided that i have to really fix up this fracture so this is how this uh, mri was there of the fracture again the fracture was in a good position see hardware removal debridement and appropriate antibiotic first thing was the infection control so i, I removed the hardware completely and then put the lots of antibiotic locally and they this way the skin flaps which were there and at one stage when the infection healed up somehow i don't do the external fixation which i feel it will take a long time and the sinuses will heal so this fracture i had after doing it i had immobilized into the knee joint which had already been gone so above knee plaster was done and then i went down after two months and did this double plating and a bone grafting this is how it was treated by double plating and bone grafting two months later the sinus redeveloped which was again cleaned out and then as you can see after six months this gap was there and probably the fracture was already infected wasn't sure about it the so 14 months slowly the fracture showed the signs of healing because this is a good fixation which is there double fixation which is a good fixation this was the skin condition as you can see with the flaps and everything all around and this is what he is walking about so eight months and this is the 14 months after the fracture he is walking about fracture it healed up he was pain free he was very happy the things have improved upon and then here he goes he has a good range of movement at the knee joint is not very good. So he has to now do something for that. The range of movement at the knee joint had to be improved upon and the skin which was good. So he went to the physiotherapist and the physiotherapist started the treatment because this, is, this was the range of movement which was there as you can see here. This was the only range of movement which was there. So once the treatment started, so one year treatment discharging sinus, so the implant was removed and calcium sulfate with the antibiotic was put in. And still the range of movement was the same. I was only bothered about the infection part of it. This is how it was done. One year, three months after the sinus and everything. And then this is how that antibiotic coated uh, uh, calcium sulfate crystals you can see the fracture is held up but the infection is there and then me and the patient had a sigh of relief fracture held up the sinus went down everything was perfect picture abhi baki hai some doctor in order to get the movements manipulated the knee and then the patient ended up again with a fracture here because this knee was gone the surgeon who took it up probably didn't understand this and then so he came back to me and again i treated with this one long plate and a grafting there locally again there was a still the fracture was not healing up i don't know why i didn't decide to do a second plate there but since the long plate which was there i did the grafting later on in this area and then as you can see now the fracture is healing up the grafting which was done six weeks after the grafting, the patient walking again. And this is how he is. This is 12 months after the last operation. And this is how the wound was. This is the range of movement was. Now the two years after the last surgery, four years after the injury, the fracture is held up completely. Patient is now walking about, moving about, fairly well, fully functional, is asking me to remove the plate. I am not very keen to do anything to him. I said, now you are better, leave yourself and go ahead. This is how these fractures can be treated successfully. It takes patience, it takes time. And unfortunately, he went through a cycle because the knee was manipulated and got the fracture there. You see the distal tibia non-union. This was the fracture which was treated, 40-year-old fresh fracture which was initially treated by this plating 
And as you can see, three months post-surgery, it appears as if the fracture is healing up. Though it's not in a good position, so there was no need to probably go in and then it appeared six months later also as if the fracture is healing up. And it is a nice scene there. This is a malunion. So probably even I decided, let the fracture heal up and then we will correct the deformity after the things. And you can see here the fibula also was deficient and the, but it was hold, held up very well. Is one year, pain and discomfort on walking. So patient was not comfortable. And still one year, though appearing of the fracture was not so bad. So I did a CT scan and I realized that this is a definite non-union on CT scan. Now, as you can see, still the fracture is not here. It is appears as if it is very good. The CT scan shows it is a non-union. So I went down. Now the CT scan is proved to and when I went down, all this hydroxyapatite, local Indian hydroxyapatite was all which was there. And that, that was the one which was giving the impression of that the fracture is held up. Actually, this was only a non-union. This was a non-functioning hydroxyapatite, which was all splintered all over. And this was the non-union which was there of the fracture. So now I had to remove all that fracture non-union, which was treated, curated it out. And then I did the intramedullary nailing from the fracture site, correcting it. Intramedullary nailing was done. The reaming was done distally and proximally. And then the nail was pushed in after full correction. As you can see, the things was done. This Even these wires were in the way, so they were removed ultimately. And then the nailing which was done, and the nailing which was done, so wires were removed and only this circlage wire was kept. And it was uh, reamed. It was supported by a plating and a massive bone grafting. And then this is how the situation is after the end of the operation. This is how it is going on. And the fracture is now two months. <coughs> Probably healing up. <coughs> It's very difficult to know whether it is healing up or no. This is four months time. This is 13 months. <coughs> now a patient is walking about pain-free, moving about and walking about 13 months it took for this fracture to heal up. This is the close view. As you can see, the fracture is completely healed up. You can see there are three screws distally and the plate, and the massive graft. This is absolutely required for the fracture healing, uh, rigidity and the massive graft this is the one which is absolutely required. Unless this is being done, the fracture will not heal up. Now here I am just showing you the shingling, because this is not being done, I feel, by majority of the people properly. This is the shingling which I'm trying to show you here. This was a fracture, non-union. You can see this was the non-union there. And this was the one which I infected it was. So I put it down and put in the calcium sulfate with antibiotics and put it into the plaster. And then this is how it is at the end of the infection being controlled completely. This was the x-ray. So when I do the shingling, this is how I go ahead and do the shingling. Go down first and take it above the fracture and below the fracture, take a full osteoperiosteal flap. So this osteoperiosteal flap, once it is taken out, this is a small piece of bone which is taken off the bone and which is attached muscles. And this is a fracture. This is in principle, this is a shingling and quite good amount of area which is being removed from here. So that this is the bone which is there, which is attached 
muscles to good vascularity. Ultimately, the healing of the bone graft occurs through the muscles. It doesn't occur through the bone. And then this is again, it is stitched back after it is being removed and bone graft is being put. It is stitched back. And as you can see here, after the bone graft, it has been stitched back. It is shortened in order to get the compaction of the fracture. The muscles are intact, so that's the reason why it heals up. And then here it is the video I am trying to show. Okay. This is the graft which I have already collected. You can see I am taking out an osteoperiosteal flap from the both the ends. Same thing is done on that the opposite video, side, yeah. which will be shown. You're going between the bone and the periosteum, and a small piece of bone, you try to take it out along with it. So the periosteum and the muscles, which is attached, and the small piece of bone is taken out there. It is a typical shingling which you're doing it. You're doing it, no? Yes. Okay. Stop. Now, having done that, open up the medullary cavity Real. with this Chota tha, small tha. owl, and it has to be done with then the breeze. You, you, you have to be careful. Me you don't line. break it because it has to be into the same straight line. That's what I am telling my assistant that you do it in the straight line. So now, if you feel see that you don't you are in the medullary cavity, you open up the medullary cavity. Yeah. Again with the scoop and the owl, you open up the medullary cavity on both the sides. Nibbler. Take out the ends of the bone which are which are devoid of any vascularity. Continue, huh? We just refreshen the edges of the bone. Both the sides it is done. Opposite side also will be done the same way. Okay. Now it is reduced as you can see by traction and the distraction. And by putting this bone clap it is reduced. Once it is reduced, keep it reduced for some time so that the soft tissue will okay. relax. Now it is very well reduced. You can see the X-ray after reduction. Second. Now you put the plate and put it this bone graft into the flap which you have elevated of the osteoperiosteum. <laughs> that is the one which works the best. You put this bone graft all round into the osteoperiosteal area. So this is the one which ultimately heals up extremely well. This is the typical way in which one should do the singling because that is the way in which you can have a maximum chance of a healing. As you can see here, the bone graft is put it on both sides of the fracture and inside the fracture also. As you can see here from the hole, I am pushing it inside the fracture. This is the one which is the one which is a maximum chance because as you can see the bone graft is also put not only at the fracture, proximally to distally. So all this area which is covered up with the bone graft, this is the one which will heal up extremely well with a good amount of callus formation without infection. Now I'll just try to show, this is what I thought it is my unique method. And uh, uh, I presented it also once or twice and people were very happy that this is how I was doing the singling. And this is how the x-ray which was there. And this is ultimately the fracture has been fixed up with the cancellous bone graft. And this is the one which has been ultimately held up. I've been doing, I've been doing this for a long time. 
This was my unique method of preparation of the recipient area. This is what I thought till I prepared this talk. This is my innovation. But then Robert Judet first described the method of osteoperiosteal decortication in 1963. And 92%, 92.3% success rate in eight months time. Very little literature is there on this subject. That the conclusion is never see Google if you want to keep your ego intact. Very few people would have gone back and found it out that Judith did this in 1963 and they would have given me the credit of doing this surgery. But while doing the things, I again went through the whole literature and this is the Japanese people who have been doing this technique of prepare the bone of autologous bone grafting in non-union surgery, Japanese author. The procedure is divided into two steps. First, both the ends of the fracture fragments are chipped into the small pieces using an osteotome and hammer without peeling off the periosteum, creating a pathway into the bone marrow. As you can see here, this is a non-union. And what he is trying to do is to this ends of the bone, he is chipping them out with the osteotome. And he is putting this, this is the bone chipping which is done. And then he is putting this bone graft into this area which has been chipped into. Second, the cancellous bone is harvested from the iliac crest and is grafted into the aperture created by this previous bone chipping treatment. And it didn't curate the fibrous tissue. And, uh, and at the fracture gap due to the results from this previous research revealing that the human non-union tissue contains osteogenic or chondrogenic potential for progenitor cells. And so he felt that by you don't remove everything. By this, you will also need a comparatively fewer amount of a grafting which is required for that. And this is what was his method of treating. Not many people have been reported this, particularly by many other authors. But I thought this was a very interesting thing in the literature. Now I talk about the distal femur non-union. It increased after the distal femur lock in place. One of the few factors which have created problems is the distal femur locking plate because the non-union rate has increased dramatically of that. This is, you can see, this was the fracture with the proximal fracture and there was, a, there was a distal fracture which was fixed with this distal femur locking plate and this, this was the fracture ultimately ended up into a non-union and this was the fracture which was treated with the grafting by me and uh, I thought this fracture is healed up now, but ultimately this was the healed up fracture, which was after the plating. This had given stability and the fracture attempted to heal, but it gave way to my surprise, even after this amount of good healing, which was seen, I told the patient that the fracture is healed up, but this gave way again and the fracture again went back into non-union one and a half years after the earlier surgery. And then I realized that these fractures at these levels are far better treated by a supracondylar nail is a better option than this nail, than this face. So I now have converted back to the supracondylar nail most of the time when the fracture is up to here. In an intraarticular fracture still, I do not do a supracondylar nailing, but extraarticular fracture, almost all the time, I change over to a supracondylar nailing. And the incidence of a non-union into the literature is fairly high. It is 64 patient distal femur and there's the outcome, the parameter callus size in a distribution in six months time. And this is the one which is, gives you the situations where significantly less periosteal callus formed in the fracture stabilized with locking plate than with intramedullary nails. Less callus was found with stiff stainless steel infrastructure and those with more holes feel compressed compared to the less stiff titanium constructs and those with empty holes near the fracture gap. This reported more non-unions in a stainless steel plates, 23 compared to the titanium plate, 7%. This is a very, very peculiar output which is there of the implant. And this is the many reports which says 21% non-union with the distal femur plate. 22% non-union which requires a new surgery. And this is the one which is much interesting. Diabetes and the plate length, less than 10 screws holds 
the less than 10 or 10 screw holes plate was the one which predicted for a secondary procedure. So what is recommended today is 11, 12 hole plate, put up only three screws proximally on an alternate hole. And this is the one which is supposed to give you the best function. Now in a periprosthetic fracture, this periprosthetic fracture like this, distal femur plate like this, if you put in, gives you a good stability and the fracture heals up with the same axis and everything which is there. Patient moves about, walks about and everything is fine. But if the fracture is here, as you can see, this has been treated by one plate here. And this is the plate which is very good tendency to get a non-union. Now this is the fracture which does not unite. As you can see, the, this fracture, which is which has been treated with only one plate laterally, it always goes into non-union, as you can see it over here. So this is the one which I feel that they are not treated adequately because if this is a fracture which is of this type, when you put in the lateral plate, only one screw is actually going through the distal fragment. And that is not good enough for that. So I feel that this sort of a lower down fractures, you got to put in double plating, two screws so that when you put in the medial plate, it is having three screws onto the distal fragment and it gives you the good stability. So my suggestion is that if there is a flare of the femur which is there, at the flare of the femur or lower than the flare of the femur, if there is a tick after TKR, the fracture below the flare of the femur, primary double plating should be done in order to get the healing of the fracture because the distal femur single plate doesn't really hold. Here was the patient with the TKR who had a fracture, single plating was done, and this is the one which went into non union. I took over at this time, and this is the one which I converted into a double plating and calcium with vitamin D and the uh, teriparatide. I always give it into these non-unions all the time for an off-label use of a teriparatide. And the double plating, the fracture heals up. But you can see this here. I had compacted the fracture, had TKR instruments and everything, keeping the axis of the femur properly and had increased the insert length because I had compressed the fracture, which was in non-union, and then did the double plating. So this I could do it only by increasing the insert of the TKR of the same thing which was there. And so there's the reason why the fracture heals up. But at times there's non-union of the distal femur, which is here. Again, it goes into non-union, but you can see there's the pre-existing osteoarthritis. This fracture, I feel there is no point in trying to get the fracture united because again, the patient will have pain. I feel this is a very good option in osteoarthritis knee with a non-union. Though I feel immediately after the fracture, I wouldn't like to do this. But this is the one which I converted to KR, TKR with the stem and the side plate and the huge bone graft which was available. The fracture heals up very well. This is an option which is worth keeping in mind as you can see, otherwise this fracture will, would have not healed up. Now here was the other one, distal, distal humerus fracture. This was the fracture ulna which was treated. That is not much of a problem, but distal, this was inadequately treated by these two leg screws. This is not enough. Three days, the first surgery. And then as the time passes by two and a half months, these screws will not hold on there. That went into non-union. And as you can see it very well, this is the non-union which has occurred there. The second surgeon went down, this was the proved non-union. CT was done, the second surgeon was very clear about the way the fracture is and everything. And second surgeon went down and did this sort of a plating. This is not again fixing up the, in, in the fracture which is in non-union. So this also would not hold. Unfortunately, this also went into non-union. And this was a painful elbow all the time. And this is how again the CT was done. This It was established, it was a non-union. So I went down and I did this reconstruction of the articular surface after an olecron and osteotomy. Reconstruction of the articular surface first. And then I did the plating and I... Um, 
that fracture was reduced and a buttress plating was done. And this double plating, which was done, ultimately this fracture healed up. And as you can see, there is a good range of painless range of movement in the cube. So after a long time also, I could reconstruct the joint very well. And that piece, which was a condyle, which was fractured, could be put back into the position and the fracture could heal up. And as you can see, complete healing has occurred with a good range of movement. And this is the range of movement which is there. The full extension does not come into these fractures. Now, this was the another patient. Short plates. They placed too short. So they were removed and it was a non-union which was established and I went in. And you can see this range of movement which was there with the non-union. So I was very happy with the range of movement at that moment. So I went down and did the operation. You can see she had a deformity. So I corrected and I, this was a CT scan. It was confirmed it was non-union. As you can see it very well. These pieces were very small, I felt. And so I converted this into this two K wires and a tension band into these small pieces. Fragments too small. But what happened was I started mobilizing. This is the fracture which was treated and I started mobilizing and started mobilizing the whole fracture fell apart. All the fracture went into non-union. So again, I had to go down. I went down again. Stiff elbow when tried to mobilize, made the construct unstable. Actually, what would happen is that range of movement, which I showed earlier, was occurring at the fracture side. And once I stabilized the fracture, the elbow was stiff. It was not moving. And when we are trying to moving this uh, elbow, Actually, the, all the movement were occurring, uh, they transmitted to the fracture site and it, the implant collapsed. So I went down again. Place should not have ended at the same level, but otherwise this is how I went down to the plating I, which was done and the mobilized the stiff elbow and fixed the plates and screws. After putting the plates and screws, I went in particular and I did adhesiolysis. And on the table, I got the range of movement, which was about 90 degrees plus. And then, as you can see, once that was done, I think started mobilizing it. After four surgeries and four years, this patient had an excellent range of movement, good supination, pronation, good flexion extension. So earlier, my first surgery, which was done, I felt that the elbow is mobile, but I had couldn't really test it after the first uh, reconstruction which was done with tension band wires. Then I would have realized that the elbow after fixing the fracture is totally stiff, which I realized it after doing this operation. So I had gone ahead and did the mobilization of the elbow by adhesiolysis. And this is what is required. If the stiff elbow is there, the fracture will not heal up. The lessons learned is Stiff elbow needs surgical mobilization after fixation to relieve the strain on the new construct. And this is what I'm talking about. This was the medial malleolus non-union. This was one of the rare situations. 2009, this is surgery, was done injury about eight years back from the day I'm talking about. This is December 2009, surgeon had done this tension band. And then the one year, that is January 2010. This was the implant which was removed and patient carried on with minor discomfort. And now again came five years later, October 15. Minor pain persisted on the same site, investigated, he saw the x-ray. And the surgeon also asked for the MRI. So the MRI was asked. The different sites of MRIs were done. The Fracture seemed to be all right on MRI. So MRI was concluded that there is no abnormality and the patient carried on. And then now he carried on with this minor discomfort and two years again after that MRI, he visited me with this X-ray. I felt this is something which is not right. So I did the CT scan of this. And as you can see here, this is the CT scan, which shows 
a complete non-union of the medial malleolus. So CT revealed a non-union of the medial malleolus now eight years after the original surgery. And that pain which was there, the patient was willing to undergo surgery, though walking about, but not very comfortable. So this is how it is an established non-union in 2017. I treated this. So I went down and you can see the, on the table, I could see the movement occurring of the fragment once I started it. And you can see this fragment. This is also moving. This is seen beautifully there in this uh, video. This was, so this was an established non-union mobility. Now, I went down and did the surgery for this. This is the yeah. This is seems to be the moving. I pressure the edges of the bone. This is the bones which were there. This is the non-union which was seen. And now with the fur, I really pressured the two edges of the bone. It was a burr which had to be used because everything was sclerosed and obviously it couldn't be used otherwise the cancellous bone osteotone does not work here. Burr used to freshen the edges as you can see here. And this was followed by the grafting. Now both the ends were really had to be made really fresh and bleeding surfaces without that this is not going to heal up. So once that was done, now I proceeded to do the grafting. Once the grafting which was taken in that zone, the autograph was taken and I started putting this graft. As you can see here, this is the graft which I am putting. After this is the burring and uh, making the hole so that the small cavity which is there, which has been filled up with the graft. And then it was temporarily stabilized with the KY. So this was the non-union which was grafted. And all those gaps which were there in the bone of cancellous bone, it was fixed up. And I fixed up with the KY temporarily. Now, once I fixed up with the K wire, so the fracture was stabilized and I wanted to be 100% sure. So I now start thought of putting in a strut graft in the inlay graft. So that is what was done. I'm making now the strut. This is what I am talking about. This is what I am talking about. The strut was used here. This is the strut which I am talking about. So this this was made and then in that this is the KYS which have been put there and this is the wherein I put in the strut. Having prepared the strut and putting the bone graft there, I proceeded grafting and temporary fixing KY the inlay strut put in after preparing the track. When the track was prepared, the graft which was already taken was put in. And that, after putting in that tension band, three, three wires, as you can see, this is what was fixed up. And this is what is that, the strut graft, which is, you can see it, which is inside inlay graft into the bones, which have been freshened. And this is the tension band, which was fixed up. And there you can see three months, and now you can see five months, the fracture is completely healed up. And the first time the patient experienced no pain, moving about, walking about, and he was very grateful for this surgery, which he underwent a massive surgery for the small problem. And has a full range of movement and complete mobility. Last, I touch on the alendronate fracture. This alendronate fracture is well known, is very notorious. It does not heal up very easily. And this is what is the sign which we see it again and again, the thickening of the outer cortex. 
and that that probably the thickening of the outer cortex is also often seen on the opposite side. Eight years on, Olinda is limping. She was my relative who came to my house, and this was on. She was on to the Ellendronet, so I come. I immediately took the MRI to convince her that there is something wrong in her. She was a doctor's wife. So once it was done, then we went ahead and did the prophylactic nailing. This is the best treatment for this stage to avoid the fracture. Once you do the prophylactic nailing, they can walk about, move about. And then ultimately in nine months time, it completely healed up. And as if nothing has happened, patient was fine. Bilateral involvement is observed. MRI and bone scanning have a great sensitivity than the radiography for an incipient stress fracture. I have four cases where the MRI indicated query fracture, which was ignored. The fracture ignored the fracture. One case where the MRI was normal and the isotope picked up the picked up the fracture on the CT scan. Now you always see if you treat this fracture. You, you tend to neglect this fracture, and this is the one which is always there, is the precursor things. So it should be, this is the one which was treated by the fixation. It is always to be the nail, and this fortunately held up ultimately. It presented six months after this. Both sides of the fracture is a known serially, not simultaneously. They will not happen every one day one. This is what was, uh, fixed up earlier, this is still fracture not united and the fracture happened on the other side. So note that the ununited line on the right side. This is the notorious for a non-union, we all know it very well. So this is the one, now this is the one where there was a mid-shaft pain which was there, MRI was done, which was not interpreted properly. And the same thing, this was not interpreted properly and the fracture healed up in two weeks later, the pain healed up. I had asked for the MRI. I didn't realize this is abnormal. The MRI chap didn't realize this is abnormal. He just reported some, some signs which are there, but this was the typical Ellenronet fracture which occurred, which was nailed. These fractures are notorious for slow healing and non-union. Bone graft is also probably not better quality. I prefer BMP if possible, because this is the one which ultimately BMP has a better chance of healing. This was the fracture which was fixed. Again, it was not united. So we did the, um, the isotope scan two years, the PET scan which was done, and it shows the fracture not united. You can see it very well with the hotspot there. This was the PET scan which showed it. So we went ahead. I did the bone grafting with the and the dynamic nailing which was done, thickest available nail, 13 millimeters, and then the fracture fortunately held up in four years time. So these fractures are very notorious for healing. So I feel every time you should do the treatment, you do everything. And if there is a pain in the hip joint, do not ask the x-ray of the hip joint. But you must ask the x-ray of the hip joint with upper one, upper two-third of the femur and then you can see this same patient this is the x-ray which was done this was a fracture which was there otherwise it would have been missed ask for the hip with upper two-third femur and these are the notorious fractures this is the one which i was treating there is a good amount of new bone formation which has occurred here as you can see it started here and this is the whole thing is blocked i went on to do the intramedullary nailing but i couldn't pass the nail, as uh, you can see, uh, this was blocking me the whole passage of the nail, even the reamer. So I had to go down to the fracture, ream it up all the way and then put this. By that time, I had already damaged the area I put in the graft there, but this was not enough. So be aware of a good amount of new bone formation in the medullary cavity if you're wanting to nail. It is recommended to do a nailing and not a plating as this always is the delayed union and the plate will not hold for a long time. So the surface implant I feel is not desirable and the nailing is the first thing which you should do it. And if in case any doubt, even you can do a nailing with the plating in order to get the healing process. These fractures are notorious as we know. So the teriparatide plus local ultrasound for whatever it is worth on day one to be started whether autograft is as effective 
as I said, the patient of coding BMP is probably ideal. Alendronate fracture is not so cruel. It gives time for the orthopedic surgeon to diagnose long before it fractures by this sign, which is, as we all know, it starts from the lateral side. And if we do the preventive nailing, then the big disaster is avoided. This is the one which we have to convince the patient to get this preventive nailing. So in conclusion, safe nailing for a diaphyseal fracture, closed, thick, ream, dynamic mode, locking on one side, after full traction, release, keeping the nail slightly short, if the mid shaft fracture for the future dynamization. Non-union nail plate and a medial graft. Recalcitrant non-union, intramedullary fibula and a compression plate is the ideal situation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for th sharing your thoughts on this difficult problem of non-union. It was an excellent lecture and will definitely help surgeons uh, make winning decisions. If the users have any questions, please put them in the comments below and we'll try to get them answered by Dr. Tanna. Thank you again, sir, for such a comprehensive talk on this difficult problem. And with this, uh, we end this webinar. Thank you all for watching.